Okay, so let's start our discussion from the intermediate representation and the intermediate code generation. And uh, what we started looking towards the end of the previous class was that how do we represent the intermediate representations and what are the various options which are available to us. And we were looking at certain functionalities and certain properties of intermediate representation. And the first functionality we looked at was that there's an abstraction at the source level and there's an abstraction at the target level. And we want to make sure that these two abstractions match in the process of conversion. And the fourth condition is going to be that you have a front end which is going to now translate. So when I say front end, what we have to realize is we are talking about the implementation and not a logical case. So implementation is that I'm going to club the type checking along with the code generation and it is going to be done in a syntax directed translation manner so that we finally get an intermediate code and then we will convert that into a machine code. Okay? And the back end is then going to generate the machine code from the intermediate language and benefits obviously are that we will be able to retarget the whole code and the machine independent code optimization will be possible. So we will talk about both code optimization, we will look at IR and we will see how to do code optimization on IR and we will also see how to write machine specification so that we can retarget the final machine code. Okay? And this is going to be the logical model that we have a front end, we have an intermediate code generation and a machine code generator. And what we have done so far is front end and then we are going to talk about the intermediate code generation. Okay? So this is going to be the overall structure of what we discuss here. So as we started discussing that how do we write an IR and turned out that IR does not seem to have a scientific basis. I mean it has a scientific basis but it has more of an engineering problem where you say that I want to design something and what is a good design. Okay. And good design can only give you guidelines but does not have an algorithm where you say that my input is this and I'll get a good IR. Okay. So each compiler is going to use a set of intermediate representations and there are several intermediate representations we started looking at. So we have high level intermediate representation or HIR in short which we will find in literature and we can also talk about medium level intermediate representation where loop information and the array information goes away and you will reach a representation which is closer to machine but not really will be the machine, concrete machine syntax. Okay. So these are, so we see examples of each of these. Okay. And then there is going to be a low level representation which is very similar to machine or very close to machine where you actually talk in terms of uh, frame pointers, you talk in terms of registers and you talk in terms of offsets and so on. Okay. So uh, again going back to introduction, okay, just to give you so that at least what we saw at that point of time, let's divide, that there was a move very early in the history of compiler writing that you can have some kind of at least people thought that there should be some kind of intermediate representation. but there is nothing like a standard that was only a thought process and people designed them languages where you could take a set of languages and translate that into a set of machines. Okay? But it was not possible to really have some kind of IR which will be able to then represent all programming languages and will be able to generate code for all possible machines. Okay? That was not a possibility, that did not really succeed. Okay? Now, Let's start looking at therefore what are the properties we are looking in the design of an IR. So what are the properties we are looking at now? So first thing that happens is that why do I need an IR? I want to continuously transform IR. So there is going to be some kind of intermediate code generation which is going to give me some representation and then I have an optimizer somewhere and this optimizer will start doing transformations and possibly will give me back the similar IR or the same IR. And then the machine code generator is going to generate code from this. And what we want is, or what, so there are several categories of users here. One category clear is the users of the compiler, and the second category is the people who write compilers like us. Okay? Now, what is it that an end user is looking for? End user is not concerned with the IR design. Okay? They are not bothered about what goes inside the compiler. For them, the compiler is just a black box. So they are only looking at two things that I should be able to do a fast compilation and I should be able to do a correct compilation. Beyond that, it doesn't matter what kind of representation you have. Okay? So we want only 
So as, as far as the user of compiler is concerned, you are only looking at something which will be correct and fast. Beyond that, it doesn't matter. But as a compiler writer, what I'm looking at, are these the only things I'll be interested in as compiler writer? But I want to do something more than this. So what are the additional things I'm looking at in my IR as a compiler? So do, do I want something which will be flexible, which will help me in representing as many languages as possible, which will help me in representing as many machines as possible? Will it also help me in doing transformations? It will be easy to transform. Okay. So the kind of things we look at as compiler writer are we want optimizations to be simple to be written and easy to understand and easy to extend. So what may happen is that suppose, so let at this point of time, let's not worry about what an optimization is. Okay? But what I'm looking at is some kind of transformer. So if I have this transform, which is looking at some IR and is giving me again IR, and this loop can go on several times. So what I want here is that continuously I'll keep on changing my intermediate representation and I therefore want something which will be amenable to these kind of transformation. If I have a representation which is very difficult to transform, okay, then that is not going to be very useful for a compiler. Okay. So that is one thing we want. And obviously, if I have this intermediate representation which is very difficult to understand, then this phase becomes very complex. Okay. So I want to make sure that this phase does not become too complex and therefore the representation I use is also simple and straightforward. But that has an implication. It should not happen that it becomes so simple that I am not able to represent my languages and machines in this. Okay? So you have to find the balance and okay? So IR should be simple. It should not be too complex. It should be lightweighted. But it should also allow me to do optimizations and all the transformations on IR. Okay? So you have to strike a balance there. Okay? And what we are going to do is we are going to look at several IRs and we will analyze properties of these IRs and see that what each IR is going to capture. Okay. So again, continuing with the discussion on the issues which are involved into the design, okay. obviously IR is going to be impacted by the source language and target language. So if you have a class of languages, obviously you may be able to design an intermediate representation. Another class of languages may have a very different type. So both source and target machine are going to impact it. Then another thing that is going to happen is that the cost of porting. That means if I take an IR and I say that I want to have a retargeting in port generator. So at some point of time, when I plug in my machine port generator here, and this is my input, and this comes out, okay, then I want to really do this transformation. Okay, and what I'm looking at is, one is the porting cost. Another is that reuse of this design. I mean, imagine a situation where I have an IR, and I say that instead of, let's say, Intel x86, I want to port it onto MIPS. Okay? And says, no, this IR is not suitable. You have to redesign the whole IR. That means, redesign of the whole IR means that my transformer will change, and my front end will change. Front end, which is generating all this information. Okay? That means, to begin with, Okay. This was not something which was good because it is impacting so many things. Okay. So I want to make sure that all these issues are addressed in IR design. Okay. And also whether this is appropriate for <coughs> these transformations, okay, that remains a very important issue for us. So this is just a summary. So here is a small example. Okay. This example says is not may not be usable in the current machines, but historically what it is exposing is that the kind of IR design which went into and how people were able to address these issues. Okay? So there was, at some point of time, there was an IR called U-code, and I'll give you examples of many IRs. So U-code was based on PA RISC. So RISC, PA RISC was an architecture which was used by HP, and then it was also based on MIPS, which was used by SGI at some point of time. Okay? These are two very high-end servers which are available, and this particular IR was suitable for stack machine. Now what's a stack machine? Have you read about something about stack machine? How many of you know something about stack machine? Totally blank. 
Do you remember we had a reading assignment at some point of time? In February was the re reading assignment. And that clearly shows that we have not opened the book. SAT machine is described in the introduction chapter of Overland Safety Manual. How many of you have read the first chapter of Overland Safety Manual? Fantastic. So, I can declare one question right away for the answer. The performance in Mitsum is not too exciting, and Anson, we are going to have at least one question on SAT machine. Okay. You better go back and read it. So it is surprising that nobody has nobody has opened the book, textbook so far. <coughs> nobody has read the first chapter of Power Lamp City Unman. Start it from the second chapter. Wow. <laughs> no, you did not start from the index. <laughs> okay, so what happened was that there was some kind of stack machine which was used and basically stack machine is where you do not have a register architecture but you have a stack and all instructions when are going to take their options from the stack and not from memory and uh, from registers. They are going to, other than pushing it to register, they are going to take all the options from memory, will push in the stack and then operate on the stack and put results back into memory. Okay. That's the kind of stack machine we have. In fact, stack machine was the first machine which was used for porting compilers on multiple platforms. So when the first Pascal compiler was designed, it was not generating machine code for any target architecture, but they had a code coming out for a stack machine, and then all you needed to do was to port a Pascal compiler on a new machine, just write the interpreter for the stack machine. And then it could work on any platform. Okay? And writing the interpreter for stack machine is not difficult. So this is an intermediate representation, which is not very suitable for load store kind of architectures, but it's very suitable for stack machines. Okay? So both compilers, they translate, they take U code, and before they can really operate it on their machine, they get a transformation to something else. Okay? So HP decided that they want to translate it into a very low level representation, and MIPS decided that they will take this code and will translate it into some kind of MIR, and then translate it back into U code for code generation. Now, which is the better approach, the first one or the second one? Second. Second. Okay. And why the first one is not a good approach? Very few machines will be. Very few machines will be. You can write compiler for very few machines by this approach. Okay. So we can write compilers for very few machines by this approach, but this approach seems to be a lot more flexible. Everyone agrees with that? Observation is correct, conclusion is not. So observation is correct that using the first approach, I can write compilers for very few machines. Okay? But suppose I want to write compilers only for few machines, then is first approach better? Because if HP group decided that our architecture line for next 10 to 15 years is going to be same, then why should I have an IR and keep on translating? I'll straight away go to something which is very close to my machine. And I know that for next 10 years, I don't have to worry about okay? So by looking at this, you cannot really arrive at a conclusion which one is better. You have to look at the <coughs> life cycle of your compiler and see that how many times you are going to reuse parts of this compiler how frequently your machines are changed, and so on. Okay. So, issue in a new IR design is going to be, one question you have to address is, how much of it is machine dependent? Like you saw that in case of HP, this was completely machine dependent. In case of MIPS, it was not. Okay. So, if you say that my architecture line is going to be common, then maybe it's a good idea to have a machine independent, a machine dependent IR. It really doesn't matter. Okay. Then I also want to see that how expressive this is. That means how many languages I can cover, how many different languages I can cover with my IR. But suppose I say that my group is only going to write compilers for, let's say, ADA, or my group is only going to write compilers for C. Okay? Then I don't have to worry about a very general IR. I'll be only interested in IR which will very effectively express that particular language. So I don't have to have a general purpose solution 
when I say that my solution should cater only to this particular subset of languages. Okay? So I'm looking for expressiveness there. Okay? I'm also making sure that this is appropriate for code optimization or for transformation. This is another, re this is another requirement. Okay? And it is also obviously appropriate for code generation. So you can see that it should be appropriate. I should be able to easily generate this. I should be able to easily transform it. And I should be able to easily convert this into a machine code. That is always something useful, and therefore we use more than one IR. Like in case of PLS, we were saying that I'll start with view code and we'll translate it to machine code. Okay, and this is what they were doing. Like their front end. Sorry. So in their front end, okay, they had this view code which was then converted into some low, low level intermediate representation, and the optimization was straight away pushed into this. Okay. So this is the kind of architecture which was used. Okay. So continuing on this discussion. Okay. Uh, more than one IR for more than one optimization is possible. Now, why do I need more than one IR for different optimizations? Why one IR may not be sufficient for an optimization? Sleeping in the morning, sleeping in the afternoon, what <coughs> about that? Nine o'clock is too early, that's Thursday and Friday, so no response. Today is afternoon, so it's hot summer, we feel sleepy. And when do we start thinking? <coughs> so why I need more than one IR for different options, more than one option? So suppose I say I'm only doing optimization for, let's say, time. Okay, only one kind of optimization. Do I still need more than one IR? Yes, sir. For example, you may, uh, you may do the same by using different data structures. So that I'm not talking data structures. Hmm. So I'm not talking about even implementation. Implementation will come much later. I'm just talking about structure of IR. So let me give you an example right away. Let's skip this. And okay, so here is an example. So I have this instruction, uh, this declaration, and I have an array here. Okay, and now, so I have an HIR. HIR is of the form which says T1 is assigned AI J plus two. Okay, and I have an MIR which says that J plus two is assigned T1, and then I multiply that by twenty, and then I add T1 and so I add, multiply I by 20, add T1 and T2, then I multiply T3 by 4, add some base address to this and write this kind of code. Okay. Now what are the things I can do here which I cannot do here? Are there some transformations or some analysis which is possible only on the first one and not on the second one? So. Again, let me write a small piece of code. So suppose I write this piece of code which says i is going from 1 less than or equal to n i plus plus. And then I have a i being assigned something. And I have now a j being read here. Okay, suppose this is the kind of code I have. And the question I want to ask is, for some value of i, okay, or let me write, let's say, some function of i and another function of i, right? Some function of i doesn't matter. Two i plus three and three i plus one, something. Okay? Now I want to ask a question which says that for what value of i, in some iteration, value of f i will be same as value of g i. This is the question I want to answer. This may be a relevant question for some optimizations. Now suppose I use this intermediate representation. Will I be effectively able to answer this question or will I be easily able to answer this question? Or so which one, which representation will be better, this or this to answer this question? That for what value of i in some iteration fi will be equal to gi? First one, right? 
So suppose I am doing optimizations where I need to do lot of analysis on the indices, then I don't want to lose this information. Now what is this doing? What is this code for the same statement? Hmm? It is finding out the memory location where AI J plus 2 is stored. And what it does is, it is taking J plus 2 and it is assuming that dimension of I is 20 and it is now counting number of rows and taking basically the offset from the base. And this 4 is assuming that 4 bytes are being taken by each element. So this gives me total offset from the base of A and that gives me the complete address and then I dereference that and take this value of AI J plus 2. Okay. Now suppose I want to do optimizations here which are at the level of statement and saying that I want to do a register allocation here. Okay. Then obviously this will be much better as compared to this. Okay. So depending upon the optimizations I want to do and the kind of questions I want to ask, my representation is going to be different. So even when I am doing optimizations, you may find that I may be able to do some optimizations on one piece of IR and I may be able to do <coughs> completely different optimization on another IR. Okay. And here is yet another IR which I am calling now low level and if you see here what it has done is it now says that j is some value and j must be stored somewhere and suppose this is stored at an offset of minus 4 from the frame pointer. So this is saying that I want value of j from this location and then I want to add 2 to this and i is stored at frame pointer minus 8 so I take this value multiply that by 20 and so on right. So this is very close to the machine. Okay? Now, if I am doing only code optimization, now you can see that this has actually exposed all the addresses to me. So if I want to do now optimizations at machine level, then this is going to be very useful IR as compared to both this and this. Okay? Because all, my, all the addresses are available to me. In this case, you can see that addresses are not really available to me. All I am looking at are certain mnemonics. So important point to remember is that there is nothing like some best IR okay, and I may need to have multiple IRs of kind of optimizations I am trying to do. Okay? So this represents a subscript by list of subscripts. Uh, so the HIR, I think there is something missing there. So HIR represents subscripts okay, which is suitable for the kind of analysis which I just talked about which is called dependence analysis and low level IR is something which may be <coughs> making all the addresses very really explicit <coughs> and some kind of optimizations are very useful there. So when we want to do constant folding, stamp reduction, loop invariant, code motion and so on, okay, then this is the kind of IR which is going to be more useful. So we will talk about these code optimizations towards the end of the course. Okay. That is going to be the last topic. So these are… What is the disadvantage of more than two IRs? Sorry? What is the disadvantage of more than two IRs? What is the disadvantage? No, there is no disadvantage. Why do you say this? So the context of the question is not clear. I can have five, let's say five intermediate IRs. Yeah, sure. So, but uh, I will have just, uh, code writing effort will be better, but uh, uh, my optimization will be better. Yes, that is what is done normally. We just don't have a, one IR, we have multiple IRs. But I don't want to have arbitrary number of IRs. So, the way I look at the problem is that first I decide what is it that I want to do and then I decide what is the suitable IR for the kind of functionality I want to achieve. So I don't want to fix a number up by saying that I have only one IR or I have five IRs. So depending upon the kind of things I am trying to do, I may have many IRs. Now what that many is, that will depend upon the functionality. So I don't want to pack that to number one, two, three or five or anything. Right? Okay, so this point already has been brought out. Okay? So let's look at now various high level representations. So let's take this kind of code and this is something which you have frequently encountered. So what I have is now a function f which is returning type integer. It takes two arguments a and b, both are of type integer and then it has a local variable of type integer and then there is an expression that involves this argument and the local variable is being assigned this value and then it is just printing b and c. Okay. Now what are the various irs we have seen? Abstract syntax tree is definitely one kind of representation. And this is going to keep enough information so that I can reconstruct really the source. Okay? So if I look at abstract syntax tree, if I unpass the abstract syntax tree, I can get something which is very close to the source. Right? So many times when you are trying to write B assemblers, 
than this kind of IR may be something very good. Now, when you write DSMLS, so if you are doing, for example, source and source transformation, if you say that I want to convert my the C programs into Pascal, or I want to convert C++ programs into C and so on, okay? That time you don't want to go all the way to something which is very low level IR and then try to reconstruct something because it may not be possible to reconstruct. And therefore, I would like to keep my IR at much higher level which is close to abstract syntax tree and all the information I may like to put whatever is required for this conversion in the simple table. So it may look something like this. I may say that I have a function and the identifier is f here, then I have a list of parameters, then I have a body and parameter list may be given again by a recursive definition which says that first argument is A and again a parameter list, another argument is B, end of it and then I have body, then within body I have declarations and statements and so on. Okay. So you can see that in this IR, okay, I will be able to reconstruct almost something which is close to the source. Okay. If I take it to something like MIR or LIR, I may not be able to go back to what the source was. Okay. So this is something which is very useful representation. Uh, I'll have to change all these colors. For some reason today, this projector is misbehaving, so even right side is getting cut and these colors are not coming out properly. I'll change it. Okay. So, in this case, what happens is that all this information about the identifiers is going to be in the symbol table. Okay? And wherever you see this identifier, basically all this is saying is that I just want to have here a link to the symbol table and get all the information about the identifier from the symbol table. Okay? Medium level IR is going to then have features of source language. Okay? So again, what you remember what we saw in the medium IR when I was trying to translate this particular expression okay. that I really went for not actual addresses of I and J but some symbolic name for I and J. And I also recognize the fact that this is of type maybe in the float and I know that there was additional thing I need. Okay. And what was that? The two dimension array which is being mapped onto a single dimension memory. Now, what is the order in which I am going to store? So, suppose this is the A I have, it has certain rows and columns, then it knows that how do I map this two dimension into a single dimension. So, what is the map, what was the mapping I was using here? <coughs> hmm? Row order mapping or row major map mapping. So, I was going in this order. Okay. So, this is something I recognized okay, that my language supports this. I also recognize the fact that each cell was taking 4 bytes. Okay? Now, depending upon the language, it is possible that instead of row major, I may have a column major mapping. So, for example, if you have a language like Fortran, okay, it has a column, column major representation. Okay? Again, it also had information like saying that floating point was taking 4 bytes, but on some other machine, floating point could have been taken 8 bytes. Okay? So, my IR had this information, but it did not have really the machine information, but it had something about implementation. Okay, which HIR will never have. Okay, so if I go back to this, it has no information whatsoever about the machine or what the compiler was. So this is something about abstract syntax. Right? So you can see that multiple IRs are having multiple information and they are exposing different information at different places. Okay? So normally what we have at MIR is what we know as three address code. Now, this is something which is good for optimization. So, large number of optimization algorithms have been written for this IR okay, and we will again see that and this is also good for code generation for a large number of architectures. So, typically what is a three address code and this is something we will be working with for as far as our intermediate code generation is concerned. Three address code says that every statement will have at most three addresses. That means I cannot use more than three arguments and right hand side of the statement will have only one op operator, at most one operator, okay? not more than that. Okay? And low level IR is going to correspond, so we will look at examples of this and low level IR is going to correspond to more than one target architecture okay? <coughs> and multi level IR that sometimes I may want to mix in all these. Okay? So there is nothing sacrosanct about saying what my IR is, whether it should be HIR or MIR. Okay? I mean, there is no reason to say that I will keep loop and array at HIR level, but all other statements will get translated into MIR. That is also possible. So I may have a hybrid of 
all these. Okay? So important thing and important takeaway from this is, first you try to define what your functionality is, okay? and then decide what the IR should be. Rather than saying that I'll have an IR and then I'll say that let me now tweak my functionality so that it suits this particular IR. These two things cannot happen in isolation. Okay? So abstract syntax tree is one IR and this is condensed form of parse tree and useful for representing language construct. Okay? And this also gives you a very natural order of hierarchy. So if you remember that function tree I showed you, that is very clearly telling you in which order your arguments are appearing and in which order your statements are appearing and so on. Okay? So it has a nice structure okay? and internal nodes they correspond to operators and the children nodes are going to be operands and so on. Okay? And leaf nodes are going to obviously be the operands. Okay? So there is one kind of IR and DAG is again a more com compressed form of abstract syntax tree. In that we have again seen how to generate DAGs. So here is an abstract syntax tree for this expression and here is a DAG for the same expression. Okay, so what you have to remember here is that I have an abstract syntax tree here where the root is at the assign which is this operator and the left hand side is the left hand side of this and right hand side is the expression tree corresponding to this which says it is an addition of two terms and each term is B multiplication of minus. Okay? And similarly, this part, okay? and when it comes to this part, okay, what we have is that we know that since this part of the tree has been replicated here, rather than replicating it, I have one tree and then I am just having the edges going from here. Okay? So this is one kind of intermediate representation. Then another common representation is what we know as postfix representation. And what happens in postfix representation? If I just do a post order traversal, of the syntax tree, that is going to give me a postfix. Okay? Now, why postfix may be useful? What are the situations in which a postfix kind of IR may be useful? Stack based machine. Stack based machine. So, if you have stack based evaluation, okay, then having a postfix makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's no point then having a tree. Because once you convert it into postfix, all you're saying is that all your operators will be on the stack. And whenever you get an operand, your operators will be on the top of stack, pop them out, do the operation, and push the result back. Right? So then, postfix is going to be very useful. So you have just the list of nodes of the tree, and nodes are going to appear immediately after its children. Right? You know about postfix traversal. Okay? So if I now say that I want to convert an expression E into postfix, how will I do that? Okay. If it's just a variable, then what is the postfix notation? The variable itself. But suppose I say that I have E which is of the form E1 of E2. What will be postfix of this? What will be postfix of E1 of E2? E1, E2, of. Is this correct? Yes? No recursive definitions? That E1 also has to be converted into its own postfix? Yes. How do you know that E1 is not to be converted into postfix? So if I write something like this. Will you get a correct translation? No. So then it has to be E1 prime and E2 prime, where E1 prime and E2 prime are recursively postfix definitions of E1. Right? And these are small things you have to remember. I mean, just blindly don't say that. You never know what E1 and E2 are. These are just expressions, right? So even those expressions need to be converted into postfix. Okay? So if E is an expression of this form, which says E1 of E2, then postfix of this is going to be. E1 prime and E2 prime, which are postfix of E1 and E2, and this is E1 prime and E2 prime along. Okay. And if E1 is an expression of form which is bracketed expression, then what will be postfix of this? If this is of this form. If I say, what will be postfix of this? Why do I use brackets? Bracket 
clicks are just to make sure that I'm applying the right ingredients and right associated with it. If you have a post fix, do you still need to have brackets? No, right? So I can throw your brackets. So what will be post fix of this? Bracket with expression E. Just post fix of E, right? So that is going to give me just feedback, nothing else. Right? Okay. So continuing on post fix notation, you don't require any parenthesis, okay? Because post fix notation itself is going to capture all the associative incidents. Okay? And post fix notation, therefore, for this kind of expression is going to be where I'll say that even assignment is an operation. Okay? And then you can see that this becomes very suitable for a stack machine evaluation. All I need to do here is that I'm going to push A, I'm going to push B, then I'm going to push C, and then I'll say now I have a unary negation and therefore pop this value and negate the value and then push the value on the stack. And then I'll say star, star will now say take B and minus C and do a multiplication and put the result. Okay? So by the time I finish this, the value will be stored in. Okay? So very, very suitable for stack type okay? uh, What is three address code? So three address code is, and this is going to be something which we are going to use for all the examples we have because there is something which is close to most of the machine architectures we talk about. Okay? And three address code is where all my instructions are going to be of the form x is sign y of z, which is the most general case. Everything else will be a subset of this. And what that means is that on, I'll have at most three addresses. On the right hand side, I'll have at most one operator. And at most, so I can have fewer. Okay? So x, y, and z are some names. So these, these need not be variables. These are either variables which are written in the program or these could be internally generated by the compiler. Okay. I can have temporary names there and they could also be constants. Okay. And op stands for any operator. In this case, this is a binary operator. But suppose I have a unary operator, then what kind of expression I'll be writing? I'll just say x is a sign minus 1. Okay. And if I have no operator, then I'll just say, if I just have a copy instruction, then it could be just x being defined by. Okay. So I can have three address code of this form where only one operator on the right hand side and if I now say that I want to generate three address code for an expression which is x plus y star z, what kind of three address code I will have for this? <coughs> so if I want to say x what is the three address code I am going to write for this? T is equal to assign y star z and r equal to x plus t. Okay. So normally what we we'll do is that we we'll use only t and I will subscript it with different numbers to say these are all temporary which have been generated internally by the compiler. These are not user variables and therefore I may use something which is little more informative, but really what you have pointed out is correct. That is really the three address code. Let us say t1 is y star z and t2 is x plus t1 and so on. Okay. So I will write this kind of code okay. and t1 and t2 are compiler generated temporary names. Now immediately at this point of time, what should bring a value is that when I say that I am now trying to convert an expression like this into a three address code, okay, you can really see that what I am doing here. Okay, at machine level. So this is not really machine code, but at machine level, what is it that I am doing? What kind of code I end up generating for T B T1 being assigned by star Z at machine level? So I'll say load Y, load Z, multiply the two and store value in register R1. Okay. And then I'll say load X and add R1 and whatever location I loaded X and store that into R2. Okay. Now also, what I could have done, if you see from the point of view of optimization, if I find that none of them are in registers, then I will say load Y into R1, load Z into R2, multiply the two and store result into R1. Okay. And then R1 already has T1, then I will say load X into R2, add the two and store result into R1. So with two registers, I will be able to do all the computation. So if I can remember all this information and this, this will get exposed when we really do machine code generation from the three address code that how I am going to manage my registers. Okay? 
So three address code you can see is something which is very close to most of the machine instructions that kind of node store architectures which have registers. Okay? So this also takes all the complex expressions like, so I will not call it very complex, okay? this is straightforward expression. But if you can see that even if you have a complex arithmetic expression, okay, then I am going to almost take this and convert that into a sequence of three address codes. Okay? So if you recall, I took this and converted this into a sequence of three address codes. So what did I do? I took the first index, I took the second one, added two to that, took the row, uh, row width, multiply that to the first one and found out the offset of i and j plus 2, then multiplied the whole thing by 4, took the base address of a, added it, and that gave me, that really gave me the full computation of a i j plus 2, right. So this way I can expose all the address information and the use of name immediately allows it to be really easily rearranged. So for example, if I had, so take an abstract syntax tree for this. Abstract syntax tree for this will look something like this, right? Now suppose I want to rearrange this, okay? I want to reorder this, okay? Here is one computation, here is another computation, okay? Now suppose there was a situation where I say that I want to switch order of computation here. So take a situation like this where I say my abstract syntax tree is And now I say that normally I'm going to go from left to right and therefore I'll say that this is going to be evaluated first, then I'll evaluate this and then I'll add the two, okay? Now suppose I did not have any side effects in evaluation of A, B, C, and D. These are straightforward variables. I just loading, I'm loading this information. Does it matter in which order I compute this, whether I compute this or I compute this? Does it really matter? No, okay. But now suppose I want to capture this information here and say that now instead of this computation, do this computation. What will I have to do on the tree? I have to do a transformation on the tree. And that transformation on trees can be very complex depending upon the kind of operator you have. As opposed to that, imagine that I have a three address code. Now how will three address code look? So three address code may look something like this. T1 is assigned A plus B and T2 is assigned C plus B. And then I may say T3 is assigned E1 plus T2, okay? And now I want to do the same transformation. What will I do? I'll just reorder them. I'll say, well, just take it here, okay? And I'm done, okay? So this textual transformation, okay, is going to be a lot easier on three address code as compared to abstract syntax trees, okay? So use of names and intermediate values, this allows three address code to be re easily rearranged. Basically, if you see T1 and T2 here, T1 and T2 really correspond to nodes of these subtrees. Okay? So rather than using this kind of tree, if I start using names explicitly, then this rearrangement becomes easy for me. Okay? This point clear because all these are going to be required at the time of code generation and code optimization obviously. Okay? Uh, so three address code is nothing but if I just linearize this and say that whenever I am linearizing for every node or every subtree I introduce a temporary name, then I'm done. So in fact, another way to write three address code may be that I just linearize it and I, instead of using temporary names, I start using the memory addresses. So I can say that I'm going to now put code into this form which will say that I'll have plus a b and this instruction is going to be some address a1. Okay? And then I can also write something like saying that I have plus C and D and this is address A2 and then I'll say that address A3 is nothing but plus A1 and A2, okay? So this is another notation which is commonly used and therefore what may happen is that these are nothing but really pointers here, okay? So instead of using temporary names, I can also use addresses, okay? So various kind of representations are going to be used here. So three address code is nothing but some kind of linearized representation of abstract syntax tree, where for each sub node, I have put an explicit name or an explicit address, rather than just keeping some kind of tree structure, okay? So continuing on this three address instructions, I may have a set of assignments. So assignments will look something like X being assigned Y of Z, 
or x may be assigned of y or x may be assigned y. So, this really captures all possible combinations of binary operators, unary operators and straight away time, right. And I can also have jumps which are either unconditional jump which says jump to L, okay. So, what is address here? So, I have an address in go to L. Like we said that I can have an address here which is x and y in z, x and y in x and y. What is the address here in go to L? Address of the address of the instruction. What does that mean? Address of the instruction. So is label an address? When I say go to L, L is a label. Is label an address? Yes, no. If you have written assembly language program, you know when you say jump to a label, what what it means is that change your PC value from whatever is the current PC value to the new PC value where the instruction with label L is stored, right? So L is an address here, and this says if x rel of y, and this is some relational operation, so x and y are not two operators, then jump to L. So this is a conditional jump. Okay. So this says that if this is true, then jump to this. Okay. And if it is false. <coughs> And what do I do? Can I have a statement which says if x of x rel of y go to L1, else go to L2. Can I have that kind of instruction? Yes, sir. Next line is this So that will give me four addresses which are not converted in three address codes. Okay. So I'll use a fall through mechanism, therefore, that if this fails, I'll just fall through and execute the next instruction. Right? Okay. And similarly, I may have for indexing. So I may say x is assigned y i and x i may be assigned. Can I write x being assigned y i plus k? So, what are the three addresses here in this? x, y and i. So, x and y are the base addresses of or x is address of x, y is the base address and i is the offset. These are the three addresses I have. Okay. And what is the operator on the right hand side? Do I have an operator here? So, operator here is I am just saying base address plus offset. That is the operator. Okay. So, similarly, in this case, I have three addresses, but operator is on the left hand side in this case. Okay. Similarly, I can have for argument passing, I may have saying that I can have a parameter and then I can have a list of parameters and then I say now jump to procedure P with n parameters and this is return control to from wherever I came okay, or return control to label Y. Okay. Or I can have pointers, I can say that I can dereference pointer, I can take a variable, take its pointers and so on. Okay. So, you can see that with this kind of intermediate representation, I can generate code for intermediate code for a large class of languages. It looks fairly small and straightforward, but you can see that this itself can be converted into something which is closer to machine code for a large class of languages. Okay. And what we need to do now is, we need to start from program and program is going to have several parts now. Program is going to have declarations and I need to process those declarations and put information in the symbol table and it's going to have loops and it is going to have conditionals and it's going to have straight line code. I need to convert all that into three address code and that is going to have functions and procedures and I need to convert all my functions and procedures into a sequence of instructions like this <coughs> plus <coughs> management of my stack and key. Okay. So, what we are going to do <coughs> in the next classes, we will see that how do I start taking parts of the code or parts of my program and start converting that into either symbol table or a code or runtime system. Okay. So, that will start in the next class. Let us take a break here today.